But uh, before I, I start uh, really on the topic, uh, I would like to, to say a few words about uh, our group in Paris. So uh, we are interested in um, investigating quantum state dynamics for optical and spin transitions in crystalline uh, materials. And uh, the team is uh, located within uh, a relatively recent uh, institution in, in Paris, which is called PSL University. It's a, a university with several campuses, which are mainly located uh, within the Latin Quarter uh, in Paris. And um, so I work in a graduate school, which is called uh, Chimie Paris Tech. And um, yeah, it is uh, close to, uh, it's specialized in chemistry and is uh, close to uh, the Pantheon monument. And so it is really right uh, in the center of the city and it's, it's really a great uh, location. So um, our workhorse for these uh, quantum state dynamic studies uh, are the rare earth signs. And we look at them in different kinds of materials. So, they are bulk materials. Here you can see uh, on this picture, uh, single crystals, which uh, we grow with a high temperature techniques. But we are also interested in uh, nanomaterials. Uh, here you see uh, CVD uh, reactors that we use to grow thin films. And also uh, we are interested in nanoparticles uh, that can be obtained by soft chemistry techniques. There are several applications uh, we are developing these materials for. Uh, for the bulk crystals, um, we are looking uh, at applications as uh, quantum memories for light and microwave photons. These materials can also be used for uh, RF signal analysis, uh, medical imaging, and laser stabilization. Uh, all these relies on uh, the uh, optical properties of the rare signs. I will. Uh, detail uh, uh, in, in the next slides. For the nanomaterials, um, we think they could be uh, uh, useful for uh, quantum processing and also to build hybrid systems because uh, at the nanoscale we can uh, exploit uh, short range interactions uh, better compared to bulk materials. Um, for investigating these materials, that we produce in the lab. We also have uh, spectroscopy equipment. And apart from, let's say, conventional uh, spectroscopy, optical and electron spin resonance and so on, we also have more specialized uh, facilities for coherent optical spectroscopy and also optically detected uh, magnetic resonance. And uh, as you will see, most of these properties are, are interesting, uh, really uh, at low temperature. And so we, we have a range of cryostat for that. Here you can see uh, this uh, white cylinder here is a, a, a fridge we recently bought uh, to go to temperatures uh, below uh, 1K. So uh, with these uh, systems, we study uh, our materials, but also materials which are produced uh, with uh, collaborations, within collaborations, uh, such as uh, color centers in diamond and also molecular uh, materials. Today, uh, I would like to focus on nanoparticles, which uh, I think are of more interest for uh, the topic of uh, quantum gravity. Also, as you will see, I'm not sure the materials can, uh, at the moment at least, uh, uh, live up to the requirements uh, for such uh, quantum uh, gravity experiments. So uh, also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, people uh, in my group right away. So uh, my uh, uh, co-permanent co-workers, uh, so Alexandre Thaler, Alban Ferrier, Diana Serrano, and also uh, people who specifically worked on the result I will show. Uh, Shuping Yu here, who uh, was a postdoc researcher in the group, and Alexandre Fossati, who recently um, defended his uh, PhD. Uh, okay, so uh, rare slot crystals. So the, maybe a little reminder about rare earth uh, ions. So uh, they consist of uh, uh, this uh, lanthanide series here at the bottom of the periodic table from lanthanum to lutetium. And this series corresponds to a uh, filling of the 4F uh, shell and usually also uh, scandium and yttrium, which are in the same column of the table, are also added to uh, the rare earth. 
So these elements uh, are, are nice because they are usually very stable when they are adopted into a variety of materials. Uh, they show a little bleaching, their valence is very stable. As I already mentioned, they can be doped into single crystals, uh, films, particles. And uh, here on this picture, you see uh, a boule, a crystal boule uh, of uh, yttrium ososilicate doped with europium 3 plus ions. And under UV excitation, you see this, this uh, red glow here is due to uh, europium 3 plus emission in, in the red uh, spectral range. So, uh, rare signs have many applications, uh, also in photonics as uh, lasers, phosphors, uh, bioprobes, and more recently, uh, some interest uh, came uh, uh, for uh, quantum technologies based on rare signs. And this is because they have a particular energy level structure, uh, at least particular in the solid state. So first of all, uh, rare signs have many optical transitions uh, in the visible and infrared range. Uh, the 4F electrons are screened by closed shells and because of that, a long optical coherence lifetime uh, can be uh, observed. Uh, however, because of spin orbit coupling, only uh, these properties can only be really observed at uh, liquid helium uh, temperature. So typical values for optical uh, coherence lifetimes uh, for optical transition are between 10 microseconds and one millisecond, uh, depending on uh, the particular error sign and the material uh, experimental conditions. And um, this is quite uh, unusual for a solid state system. And again, this is due to this 4F electron screen. Uh, the next important property is that uh, these ions uh, can have electron and or nuclear spins. And here uh, it's interesting because the spin levels they usually uh, can uh, show uh, longer coherence lifetimes, uh, typically one order of magnitude. So spin levels would have a T2 uh, within a range from 100 microseconds to 10 milliseconds. Now, as you probably know, uh, spin transition can be uh, decoupled from uh, the fluctuations of the environment by using uh, specific magnetic fields or, or decoupling sequences. And so uh, right now, the current record for rare signs uh, is uh, six hours of um, spin, nuclear spin coherence lifetime in European. Uh, and this is really, I think, a, a very uh, unique property for spins, which can be optically addressed. So um, since these optical transition and the spin transition can be connected, so coherences can be transferred between uh, optical and spin transition, uh, rare signs are a promising interface for uh, going from, let's say, quantum light atom spin interfaces. And as bulk materials, uh, they have been uh, really investigating in, in a, um, a deep way, let's say, uh, for optical uh, quantum memories. And just as an example, I would like to show you some recent results we obtain on uh, ytterbium dot bulk crystals in, for this application of quantum memories. Uh, first, we, we, we started by looking at optical and spin coherence times, and we found out that in this uh, particular system of uh, using, uh, where we use a specific isotope of ytterbium, ytterbium-171, uh, we could show that it's possible to obtain long optical and spin coherence time at the same time. And this happens when the external magnetic field is precisely zero, and this is due to uh, clock transitions that here for the optical and the spin transitions uh, at this uh, particular zero uh, field situation. Uh, so this is, uh, was a very promising result. We also looked uh, in details uh, in this paper here, we looked uh, in details about uh, spin dynamics uh, using uh, electron uh, spin um, uh, resonance. Uh, and after that, uh, because of these nice properties, we were able to, to move to uh, optical storage. 
And here, by transferring the optical excitation to the spin transition, it was possible to show a millisecond range uh, uh, optical storage uh, in this iterable system. And finally, uh, in this uh, result here, we were able also to uh, manipulate uh, the spin uh, polarization in this system. And by uh, optical pumping, we could obtain a large scale spin polarization uh, this had the effect to reduce magnetic noise in the system and further enhance coherent lifetimes. And uh, for the optical transition, we were able to approach the radiative limit. And so we could observe coherent lifetimes uh, around 800 microseconds um, in this system, which uh, is a really nice results. Um, also taking into consideration that iterbium has an electron spin and therefore is usually very prone to decoherence. But in this particular system, it's not the case. So uh, the bulk material we use when they come out of the furnace, they look like this. Uh, so you, you see the purple bull here. Uh, it's about 10 centimeters long and here the diameter is around two centimeters. And so, as you can see, uh, this uh, also yttrium also silicate material is docked with one specific isotope of ytterbium and at low concentration. And this is to reduce ytterbium ytterbium interactions. So, uh, bulk crystals can show really nice results, but we are also interested in uh, nanomaterials. And uh, first of all, I would like to give you some motivation for going to uh, nanomaterials. Uh, in this uh, framework of quantum technologies. So uh, one uh, aspect that uh, in which we are interested uh, is to enhance light matter interactions. And this can be obtained, for example, by uh, having nanoparticles uh, located in uh, micro or nano optical cavities. And as an example here, uh, we have a fiber cavity uh, which uh, has two parts. So here you have uh, a flat mirror. Uh, these little circles here represent the nanoparticles deposited on the flat mirror. And in front of the mirror, you have this optical fiber with a concave profile here. And uh, with appropriate coating, it's possible to, to get high quality factors. And also because the distance between the fiber and the mirror is very small, it's on the order of uh, microns, uh, the mode volume can be also very small. And therefore, uh, significant per cell enhancement can be expected uh, here in this situation. And with this uh, per cell enhancement, uh, different properties can be uh, obtained, for example, uh, increasing single ion emission and, and things like that, but uh, also uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, David Hunger and Hugues de Riedmatten, uh, it was, uh, they could show that in these nanoparticles, uh, it's possible to modulate the uh, spontaneous emission. So when the, uh, by varying, oops, sorry, varying the distance between the fiber and the mirror, you can have a strong per cell enhancement and light coming out of the cavity. And then by detuning the cavity, it can uh, disappear in this region and so on. And so there is possibility to, um, uh, control uh, this uh, spontaneous emission. Uh, so this is one example. Another example is uh, uh, trying to build hybrid quantum systems. And we looked at a, a thin film graphene structure, which is shown here. So this was uh, performed in collaboration with uh, Frank Coppens and Klaus Tilroy. Uh, here the idea is that uh, in this structure, uh, so you have a silicon uh, substrate uh, silicon substrate here, and you have the rare earth film in green, and on top of the rare earth film, you have the graphene. So by applying a voltage between the silicon substrate and the graphene, it's possible to vary the carrier density in the graphene layer. And by in this way, uh, two different regimes can be uh, accessed for erbium relaxation. So with low voltage, uh, erbium relaxes by creating electron hole pairs in the graphene layer at high voltage, uh, erbium relaxes by creating uh, plasmons in the graphene layer. And so by varying the, 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 the gate voltage, it's also possible to modulate uh, erbium uh, emission. Um, so in these two cases, uh, we can show that fast erbium emission modulation uh, 
uh, could be possible. Uh, this has some applications, for example, uh, single photon emission and, and these kind of um, applications. Uh, but here we are uh, mostly dealing with spontaneous emission, and we would like to uh, carry uh, these uh, carry over these experiments to low temperature to the quantum regime. Uh, but here, of course, there is a concern because at the nanoscale. It may be difficult to preserve the, the nice coherence lifetimes that are observed uh, for aeroscience uh, in bulk materials. Uh, this is because at the nanoscale, it's uh, easy to have additional perturbations coming from uh, surface defects, impurities, or the way uh, also the, the nanomaterials uh, are made. As an example, uh, in, uh, in NV centers in diamond uh, for the electron spin T2, uh, it, it can reach. Uh, up to milliseconds in bulk CVD diamond of uh, high quality, whereas in nano diamonds, it's mostly below 10 microseconds. So there is a really a, a very large difference between these two cases. And clearly, uh, preserving bulk properties at the nanoscale is uh, something of a high challenge. Now for our science, uh, optical transitions, um, there are different approaches to, to, to obtaining nanomaterials with good properties. So the first one, uh, first approach is, is to go from top to down. So starting for bulk crystal and creating uh, nanostructures in the bulk crystal uh, by uh, iron milling, for example. And in this case, uh, often uh, narrow homogeneous lines or so long coherence lifetimes can be preserved and the properties are close to bulk ones. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, you really want to obtain a nanomaterial because here uh, it's still a bulk crystal, uh, which may not be appropriate for all, all ideas or applications. Uh, the idea could be also to obtain nanoparticles for grinding. But in this case, uh, usually uh, the homogeneous lines are really broad. Uh, T2 are maybe 100 nanoseconds or even less uh, homogeneous line widths above a megahertz. And uh, here the, the problem is that the grinding process uh, in, in induces a lot of dephasing because of the strain that is uh, created uh, during uh, grinding. Our approach is different. We want to do a more chemical uh, approach. Uh, so going from uh, bottom uh, up and um, the material uh, we, we looked at in particular is Y203 and uh, in the following, I, I will talk mostly about your opium dot particles. And so uh, this uh, y true 3 host is nice, first of all, because we know that as a bulk material, long optical coherence lifetime can be observed. And as a nanomaterial, you have uh, many ways uh, based on uh, solution uh, chemistry, uh, for example, to obtain these uh, uh, nanoparticles. And in our case, we uh, came up with a multi-step synthesis and post-processing method to obtain nanoparticles, relatively small ones, with uh, good properties. And uh, the uh, uh, procedure is, is shown here. So we start uh, as a, in a first step with a homogeneous precipitation. So we start from a solution of metal salts and uh, precipitate uh, particles uh, which are amorphous. And this is uh, not yet a crystalline material, uh, Y2O3, but a precursor, uh, hydroxy, hydroxy carbonate here. And so to obtain the crystalline phase, we need some annealing. And this um, is obtained by uh, heating at 800 uh, degrees C. After this step, we now have Y203 nanoparticles, but these particles are polycrystalline. And to improve properties, we have a second annealing step at higher temperature. And after this step, now we have single crystalline particles. And uh, we are not done yet because we found out that it's important also to have a last uh, post-processing step, uh, which involves uh, plasma, uh, oxygen plasma treatment at high uh, microwave power. So the particles we obtain are shown here. Uh, they are about 100 nanometer in size. They show low aggregation, uh, narrow distribution, as you can see here. And uh, also, uh, as you can see on the picture, they are single crystalline. So uh, 
Now we want to investigate uh, coherences in these particles and what we use is echo technique. Maybe I, I just have one short slide to remind, uh, just to remind us uh, how the echo technique works. So we have a first pulse here that will excite a transition and create quantum state or superposition states. Then there is a free evolution here during a time tau, and then there is a second pulse uh, to rephase uh, the coherences and effectively reverse time evolution. And after a, a delay tau here, which is equal to uh, the delay between the first two pulses, uh, we have the response of the system, and this is the echo. So if we look at an optical transition, we will see a photon echo. If we look at a spin transition, we will see the, a spin echo. So now uh, ions that can participate in the echo emission are only those who were unperturbed between the first pulse and the echo emission. And as a result, when this delay is increased, uh, the echo uh, emission intensity goes down. In the, let's say, easiest cases, uh, you have an exponential decay. And from the rate of the decay, uh, the coherence lifetime of the transition can be deduced, or equivalently, the homogeneous line width, which is uh, inversely proportional to the coherence lifetime. Okay, so uh, now we can apply these techniques to nanocrystals. Um, so first of all, uh, to look at these uh, nanoparticles, what we do is to use a powder of these nanoparticles. So the experiment is relatively simple. We have a laser at 580 nanometers in resonance with the European transition of uh, interest. Uh, the laser is sent to the sample, which uh, is in the form of a powder and in a, a helium cryostat. After the powder, there is a strong scattering of light. This light is collected by a lens, and then uh, we, uh, this uh, scattered light is directed to a detector. So as you can see, the scattering here is very strong after the powder. The powder looks like uh, a white pellet, actually, and so scattering is very strong. Uh, this is a quite unusual situation uh, because usually photon echoes are always performed on very and highly transparent materials like crystals or glasses. Uh, here we, we found out uh, a few years ago that it was also possible to uh, obtain this uh, process in a highly scattering medium. What we do also to uh, enhance uh, detection sensitivity is to use interferometric detection. Uh, so what we do is that the time where the echo uh, is produced, we also uh, shine again the laser on the sample with a frequency shift typically in the range of 30 megahertz. And uh, so we can do heterodyne detection. And uh, this is a uh, sequence that uh, you can see on the detector. So the excitation pulse, rephasing pulse, and here's a heterodyne pulse. Now, if we do the Fourier transform of this uh, pulse here, uh, what we see is a nice peak at the frequency here, 35 megahertz, or yeah. And the amplitude of this, uh, peak in the Fourier transform uh, is uh, directly proportional to the photon echo amplitude. And of course, by using this uh, heterodyne technique, we gain a lot on uh, sensitivity. So it's not completely obvious that how this uh, echo process, which is a nonlinear process, works in, in this highly scattering medium. Uh, if you're interested in the theory aspects of this, there is a paper here, a uh, recent paper about that. Okay, now uh, we can see uh, how our nanoparticles uh, behave uh, for uh, optical uh, coherence lifetimes. Uh, wh what we see uh, here, you see the decay of the echo uh, amplitude as a function of uh, the delay between the pulses here. What we found is uh, an optical coherence time of about six microseconds at 1.4K. Uh, this is nice because it corresponds to a homogeneous line weights of 55 kilohertz. It's much lower than what I mentioned for uh, uh, homogeneous line weights in the uh, brown uh, bulk crystals. So it looks like uh, the bottom up approach is. And um, so this is nice. Uh, I would like to mention that the, 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 the way the nanoparticles are produced is, is of importance. If you don't do the last step uh, with the microwave uh, treatment, 
uh, you can see that the coherence lifetime is only about two microseconds. So this last step, the oxygen plasma uh, treatment uh, gives you a factor of three more or less on, on the optical T2. And so it, it's important. Uh, this is linked to uh, the way the defects are, uh, um, let's say, um, um, processed by this oxygen plasma treatment. And um, okay, so this is nice, but if we now compare to the T1 limit, which is only 150 Hertz, uh, or, if we look, or if we look at values in bulk uh, system, which uh, the line widths are in the kilohertz range, we can still see that uh, the nanoparticles, they have something between one or two orders of magnitude, uh, a broader uh, homogeneous line widths. And this is due uh, to limitations. Uh, after careful uh, uh, spectroscopy, but not only coherent spectroscopy, but also looking at photoluminescence, uh, time result photoluminescence, uh, electron spin resonance, and different techniques, we, we came to the conclusion that um, the, the, the main dephasing processes are due to electric field fluctuation, uh, charge noise on the surface of the particles, or maybe inside the particles. Uh, related to defects, and also uh, a residual disorder uh, that create low frequency fluctuation, so-called TLS uh, centers. So uh, these limitations are not so easy to um, circumvent, and we are working, of course, on the materials and how we also experimental conditions um, to, to see how we can uh, mitigate these uh, fluctuations. Um, now that we have uh, optical transition with good uh, coherence lifetime, uh, we can also use them to uh, look at spins. And uh, generally speaking, the optical transition are interesting in this respect because they offer extra degree of freedom compared to the spin one. Uh, things you can do when you have optical transition uh, and such schemes, so-called lambda schemes, so where two spin levels are connected to a single excited state. Uh, what is possible? Uh, interface with photonic qubits, uh, faster operation on the spin transition, uh, easier uh, implement implementation also because you don't need uh, antennas. This is something which is done in different materials. In our case, uh, we were uh, interested in a nuclear spin because europium has uh, an isotope 151 with a nuclear spin uh, five halves. So energy level structure at zero magnetic field looks like this because of uh, quadrupole interaction. You have this uh, zero field splitting here in the excited state and in the ground state. And here you can see the uh, hyperfine transition uh, frequencies around 30 megahertz or so. So what we want to do now is to address this spin transition using optical transitions. And uh, to do so, uh, we are using such a scheme. So again, the energy level structure of this isotope of europium. And uh, we want, for example, to implement a spin echo sequence. And what we are going to do is to excite the spin coherence using these uh, optical pulses. So basically, there are optical pulses with two different optical frequencies, with the difference, of course, between these two optical frequencies, which should be equal to this uh, difference uh, uh, to the transition, spin transition frequency. So, for example, here 29 megahertz. So, what we do is to uh, implement this sequence, but instead of directly uh, using RF excitation, we use optical two color pulses. Uh, so this is uh, the way to excite the spin. Now, when the spin echo uh, is supposed to appear, so at this time here, uh, what we do is uh, we send a probe. So now it's a single frequency uh, optical probe. And because we have the spin coherence uh, here, what's going to happen is that a second optical field is induced along this transition. And the second optical field is going to interfere with the probe field and we will be able to see a beat node between these two uh, optical uh, fields. And uh, what we do, again, is to do the Fourier transform of this probe signal and retrieve uh, the uh, echo amplitude 
and uh, uh, determine the spin echo amplitude from the amplitude of the Fourier transform of the optical probe. So very briefly, the experimental setup is shown here. We start from a stabilized dye laser. We have some modulators to create pulses and uh, change frequencies. Here in this acousto-optic modulator, we generate the two color pulses. Uh, then the, signal, uh, the laser is sent to the uh, sample here. Uh, and again, the scattered light is collected with a lens to a detector. In these experiments, we are using different particles. These ones are a bit larger. So now they are not 100 nanometers as before, but 400 nanometers. Just to show you what kind of signal to noise ratio we have. So this is uh, the Fourier transform of the propulse. Uh, and as you can see, this component here at the spin frequency is uh, this amplitude here is directly proportional to the spin echo amplitude. And the so signal to noise ratio is it's relatively good here. So uh, before we proceed to the spin echo signal, it's important also to do spin polarization to increase the signal. And uh, here now uh, we can use not only these two frequencies here, omega one and omega two, but we can also access the third frequency omega three. And the idea here is to empty these two levels here uh, these two lower levels by optical pumping mm. and get the population uh, in this level here. So uh, when uh, we perform this uh, procedure to empty these two levels and now look at the optical uh, transmission, uh, what we see is that at frequencies omega 2 and omega 3, transmission of the sample is very high because these two levels are basically empty now and you can see that we can reach 95% transparency. So the spin polarization is very strong. And also we have an increased transmission, uh, decreased transmission, increased absorption at omega one because we have more population on this level here. What helps a lot is that the spin uh, population lifetime in this system is quite long. So we have a short component, which is already uh, has a lifetime of more than one minute, but there is also a long component, which is hours long. And this very long T1, uh, spin T1, helps a lot for optical polarization. So now we can proceed to uh, spin echo measurements. And uh, what we found at low temperature is uh, uh, optical uh, spin, nuclear spin coherence lifetime in the range of milliseconds. Uh, this is uh, rather long, and I think for a nanomaterial, uh, it's unmatched actually. So uh, I don't think there are other systems showing such long uh, coherence lifetime in a nanomaterial with optically addressable spins. Uh, we can also compare these values to bulk materials. And as we can see, uh, there is still a difference, of course, between the nanoparticles and the bulk materials. Uh, here it's a bit less uh, then uh, in the case of the optical transition here, we have uh, one order of magnitude difference between uh, uh, the bulk and the nanoparticles. Then we, we, we went on with different experiments uh, to get more insight into what were the reasons for uh, dephasing uh, for the spin transition. Uh, here you see what happens when you apply a magnetic field. With very small field, you immediately see a decrease uh, in the spin in homo uh, homogeneous line rates. Uh, we were able to uh, reach around three milliseconds with magnetic fields up to uh, something like eight millitesla, really small fields. Um, this strong decrease of the homogeneous line weights indicate interaction uh, probably with electron spin, likely to be carried by defects, for example, oxygen vacancy that can trap electrons. And uh, uh, this uh, strong reduction with low magnetic field is typical of these kind of interactions. What is interesting here is that since this is due to defects, well, like in the optical case, uh, we can hope that in uh, better samples or other materials which have less uh, defects, uh, we could have uh, longer lifetimes and perhaps approach uh, bulk properties. Another thing we explored is dynamical decoupling. This is a technique where instead of sending just one rephasing pulse, there is a train of pulses here, uh, as you can see on this scheme. Uh, 
In this case, uh, this train of pulses is able to compensate for perturbation with slow correlation lifetime. So what is important here is, have, is to have a, uh, oh, sorry, a separation uh, here between uh, the pulses in the sequence. You want to have something short here compared to the correlation time of the perturbation. Um, only uh, problem here is that if you want to have this uh, sequence to work, you need uh, well-defined relative phases between the different pulses. But here we are uh, using optical excitation, and this is not so simple to uh, achieve compared to using directly RF excitation. Uh, this is working in our case because of this trick we use uh, to have a single acousto-optic modulator to generate the two color pulses. And in this way, we can have a high phase stability so between the two colors of um, the optical pulses uh, over several minutes, so we can really perform these uh, decoupling experiments. The results are shown here. Uh, so if we start with a large separation between pulses, uh, let's say 400 microseconds, we see already some uh, increase in uh, effective coherence time. So from one millisecond, now we reach six millisecond when we, uh, decrease uh, the delay between the pulses, coherence lifetime is going up. This is normal because in a way we are filtering out more and more perturbation. However, after this point here, you see that it goes down. So what we could do is reach uh, effective coherence lifetime up to eight milliseconds. So clear uh, improvement compared to uh, the normal uh, Han echo or two, or let's say simple rephasing. However, we have this problem of decreasing uh, coherence lifetime when the separation between the pulses uh, is decreasing. And this is uh, because uh, the pulses themselves uh, introduce error. And uh, when we decrease the uh, delay here, uh, when we decrease the delay, we have more and more pulses and therefore we accumulate errors. And uh, this is due also to the fact that the pulse fidelity is low and uh, this is caused by the strong scattering in the powder. And basically the optical intensity is uh, varying a lot uh, in the powder. And so it's difficult to have good pulse uh, fidelity. Uh, here again, there may be some solution. For example, if we move to single particle, uh, we could have a much better control on the pulse and therefore uh, should achieve uh, dynamical decoupling in a much more efficient way. So this is in principle promising too. Um, we looked at phase coherence too. So what we did here is to compare input output phase. So uh, we are uh, in, in a situation where we will uh, vary the excitation phase of the spin and we looked at what is uh, the output uh, after all this sequence, what is uh, the resulting spin phase after the sequence. What we saw is that, uh, of course, this is something which is required if we would like to use these spins in a, in a quantum regime. So this would be some storage, for example, uh, sequence. What we saw is that even after 10 pi pulses, uh, we could still see uh, when we looked at the Fourier transform of the output pulse here, we could see nice variation of uh, the component of the Fourier transform, real and Im imaginary, uh, as a function of the excitation phase. And this translates into a high correlation between the spin excitation phase and the spin echo phase, as you can see uh, here. Uh, another point I would like to uh, mention is that here I talked about results in Europium for optical and spin transition, but actually uh, it can be seen also uh, with other rare signs like prosodymium. So this is also a situation where we have a nuclear spin. And here also we were able to show that uh, relatively long optical and spin coherence times uh, could be obtained in these uh, prosodymium Y23 nanoparticles. So these results are not unique to uh, Europium dot samples. Um, I don't know if I still have a few minutes um, I just would like to, to show you uh, very briefly some results on uh, um, light storage in these uh, nanoparticles by means of an electro-optic uh, sequence. So uh, here is a sequence we are using. So we have an input pulse here. And what we want to look at is this output echo. So this is an input, sorry, 
this is the input uh, of the memory uh, here, and this is the output. As you can see, it's very similar to the echo sequence, but now we have two pipelines here and here. Uh, these two pipelines are necessary because at the time where we have the echo emission, we don't want to have a strong fluorescence noise. And these two uh, pipelines here, two rephasing pulses here, they can take care of this issue. Now, the problem, of course, is that if we start with a single photon here, so we want a quantum memory for a single photon, uh, we will have after the first rephasing pulse here, we will have an echo uh, at this point here. And of course, if we have the emission here, we cannot have a single photon emission at this point. So we need to cancel the emission of this echo. And this we do by using electric pulses. So these electric pulses that are applied to the powder, to the nanoparticles, they are able to control uh, europium ion phase. And uh, with appropriate pulses here, pulse area, uh, we can control the phase so that this intermediate echo is uh, canceled, actually. So this is what you can see experimentally. Uh, this intermediate echo, uh, so this is, again, a heterodyne detection. So we are looking at the FFT amplitude. So, so in essence, the uh, echo amplitude, photon echo amplitude. So what we see is that when we have no electric field, we have this intensity here. When we turn on the electric field, it disappears. So we can really cancel with a high uh, ratio this intermediate echo. Um, the output echo, however, uh, does not change. And this is because we have a second electrical pulse here. So the second pulse essentially uh, reverses the effect of the first pulse. Uh, so the protocol works well. We think that this uh, extinction ratio would be suitable to operate in the quantum regime, although all these experiments were done in a purely classical regime. Um, what we can do now is look, for example, at um, the uh, storage time. And because we have these long optical coherence times, we can also have long storage times. Uh, the uh, effective storage time is equal to uh, the echo, uh, for, uh, the optical coherence lifetime, so about one uh, about five microseconds, but you can see that we could see uh, uh, output uh, of the memory uh, up to 40 microseconds here. Here on the top, you see a little sketch of the experiment. Uh, to apply the electric field, we have the powders between two uh, transparent electrodes, so the light can go through, and we can apply these electric pulses. <laughs> um, the sequence has the advantage of being, uh, being able to be efficient even if we have different frequencies uh, to be stored in, in the particles. Uh, and we looked a little bit at these possibilities. For example, now, again, we, we use these two color techniques to store uh, uh, optical pulses uh, uh, with uh, two frequencies in the nanoparticles. We are still using this electric field in the sequence. And uh, what we can see is that the electric field is still able to cancel the unwanted echoes, even though we now have two frequencies that are stored. Uh, and what we can do also, again, is to look at the relation between uh, the output uh, phase and the input phase. And on this figure here, you can see that we have, again, a nice correlation between the input and the output phases. So uh, now we are in the uh, optical domain. Before, we were looking at this for the spin transition. Um, what we can say is that this uh, correlation is not uh, unexpected because uh, in this uh, echo uh, uh, style of storage, uh, there is uh, effectively a, a post-selection of the output of the memory. But still, of course, uh, this is nice because we would need that if we would like to operate this memory in the quantum regime. So the so next steps in, in, in using these nanoparticles as uh, optical memories is uh, move to from optical storage to spin transfer and uh, to spin storage, sorry. And so we would like to transfer optical ex excitation to the spin excitation. And this would allow us to go uh, into a millisecond range uh, uh, for the, the storage time uh, instead of a few microseconds and also move towards single particle and cavity experiments where we could have much higher efficiency for the storage. Uh, okay, I think uh, I'm nearly done. I would like uh, also uh, to thank uh, our collaborators and different funding agencies. And uh, summary of my talk, 
uh, is as follows. So uh, I hope I could show you that rare sign and crystals are uh, promising uh, systems with unique optical and spin properties. Uh, we observed in nanoparticles uh, optical line widths of about 55 kilohertz, which uh, in the solid state are very narrow. Um, we were able to use these uh, narrow optical line widths or long optical coherence lifetime uh, to show uh, electro-optic memory in these nanoparticles with broadband and high fidelity coherence storage. Um, we also looked at nuclear spins where millisecond long coherence lifetimes could be observed. And this gives some interesting prospects for quantum memories with long storage time. Currently, we are working on different topics to improve these results. So single particle spectroscopy to get rid of ensemble measurements and averaging effects. Uh, we also need to go on with defect engineering to uh, reduce the phasing. Um, single ion detection and control is also an important topic. And uh, also we would like to move towards electron spin spectroscopy. And for example, ytterbium, which uh, I mentioned as a system which gives good result in bulk crystals could be also something very interesting uh, for nanoparticles. So thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, if you have questions, uh, I'm more than happy to try to answer them. So yeah, let us, let us thank uh, Philip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if there are any questions, please just, uh, I think best is just unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, so maybe I will. Uh, ah, I, yeah. got a, I got a question. Uh, 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 it's about like the coherence time that you said, is it like a, from a single defect or it is from multiple defects or many? Yes, yeah, so all, all what I showed here is for uh, ensembles of, uh, of um, oh, excuse me, so, uh, yes, yeah, so everything, uh, everything I showed uh, are ensembles. Um, the rarer signs, uh, when, we, when you want to use the optical transitions, these transitions uh, have long coherent lifetimes, but, but the, the, the downside is they are very weak. And this is why in the first place you can get these long coherence lifetimes. So T1 is very long. And so uh, it's difficult to detect uh, single lines. It has been done though, uh, but not uh, in the experiments I, I showed. Can I also ask another question please? Yes, sure. Uh, is, is, when you say at the beginning, you said like uh, the optical coherence time and then spin coherence time. Could you explain the difference? Like what did you mean? So uh, it's simply that, uh, uh, so the optical, optical coherence time uh, refers to the optical transition. So in the case of europium, you have this uh, 580 nanometer uh, transition. So it's in the visible range. And uh, so the spin coherence time is, uh, is a nuclear spin. So a hyperfine transition of the ground state. And here we are in, in a radio frequency range. So uh, two tens of megahertz. And of course, there's a connection between the two somehow. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, as, as you could see, uh, there is a big difference. So the optical uh, transition has more perturbation and is uh, limited to about uh, five microseconds, whereas the spin uh, is, is, is much longer. So we are more in the millisecond range. And we believe that this is due mainly to the difference in sensitivity uh, between the two transition with respect to electric field fluctuation. So the magnetic sensitivity is similar but the electric field sensitivity is very different. As, as I would say, you would expect uh, between a spin and an electronic uh, transition. So, so basically, uh, coherence time of electrons and, uh, I mean, nucleus, sorry, proton there. That's the difference, is it? Like nucleus spin time and electronic spin time. That, that's the difference. Yes, exactly. So nuclear spin on one hand and electronic uh, uh, transition, uh, electron yeah, uh, coherence okay, on thank the you. other hand. So we could also consider electron spins, of course, uh, but this uh, we have not uh, explored yet, mainly because the frequencies are quite different. Higher frequency makes the experiment more difficult for electron spins. Okay, thank, thank you very much. 
Maybe I can ask a quick question unless someone else is asking. Um, one one thing is, so how would you compare, it's a broad question, how would you compare this with the, you know, and what people have achieved with the NV centers? And and what is the last <laughs> single crystal you can get beyond the 100? Yes. So if we compare to NV centers, I would say, so the big advantage of NV centers is that uh, you have a much longer, I would say, electron spin T2, especially at room temperature. So the rarer sign, they, they do not work at room temperature. So you really need to go to low temperatures. Now, if you, you go to the extreme, I, I would say at low temperature, uh, it, it depends a bit, but I think it's, from what I recall, I still think that the NV center has a longer uh, T2 uh, compared to the rarer signs uh, at low temperature. Uh, now, however, you have other difficulties with, uh, potential difficulties with NV centers, for example, with respect to stability, uh, they can uh, ionize, they can uh, transform into uh, neutral NV and so on. So I would say in this respect, the rarer signs are more stable. And also with the rare signs, you have, uh, um, well, I mean, for some application, you may be interested in the fact that the optical transition is much narrower than in the NV centers. And also the rare signs, they can more easily be used as ensembles, whereas NV centers are usually more interesting if you are looking at single defects. Uh, as ensembles, they're a little bit less uh, easy to, to use. So, um, yeah, and so the question on the particles, uh, yeah, it, it depends how you produce the particles, but uh, uh, typically, yes, micron size is, is, is possible too. Um, if you, in the micron size, the, 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 even the single crystal the grinding could work because uh, since the particles are relatively large, you may not induce so much strain in, 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 the, in the particles. So there are different ways, I think, uh, which, in which uh, large uh, particles could be obtained. But uh, the MD center is a tough competition, I think. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. Hello, yeah. I have a question. Hi. Yes. Do you, uh, do you I, hear me? Yes, very uh, well. Okay, I uh, because <clears throat> the the subject of this series of uh, of talks is uh, gravity. Also, I would mm -hmm. like to know uh, how your experiment or your, for instance, material can be eventually helped to, um, for instance, uh, find any uh, evidence of a quantum gravity or even, uh, for instance, a gravitational interaction of dark matter, for instance, uh, with material, is it possible? Or do you think about uh, such a direction? Yeah, so uh, maybe I'm not the one to, to <laughs> the most, uh, the, the best expert to answer your question, but I, I think that the basic idea from what I understood from uh, the paper that uh, Sugato sent uh, is that uh, you would like to see how uh, spin get and can get entangled into different particles through uh, quantum interaction, which would be linked to, uh, to gravity. Uh, so uh, long spin coherence times, for example, would be something uh, advantageous in this mm -hmm. respect. Uh, but of course, it's, it's still a really challenging uh, experiment, I think. Uh, but I, I think it's probably better that I, I let the, the organizers uh, comment on this, perhaps. Yeah, because, because um, uh, in, the, in the example that uh, you gave, uh, the uh, most problematic thing is that how do you distinguish between an entanglement, huh? which, is, uh, which is due to a, a, a sort of another interaction and what is entanglement which is created by gravity. This is, this two is very, very different. Yeah, so, so this, I think I, I should uh, ask someone else to answer precisely maybe, no? Okay, okay, thank you anyway. Thanks for talking. Yeah. But I think the basic idea is to have a very little 
interaction of any other kind so that if something happens, you can say, ah, oh, this has to be due to gravity. Yeah, I think that is that is the right kind of approach. Yeah, we have to reduce all the other interactions, including all those things that deco here. And this is why we are interested in knowing about this system, that, uh, that it is having this exceptional coherences, of, uh, 10 millisecond. Mm -hmm. yeah, Should I? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Uh, can I ask you a question? To Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the your quantum memory now your uh, so from gravity to, to memory. Um, so the uh, the photon people wants to have quantum memory to uh, to use it as uh, to uh, for for many photons to to interfere. Uh, now, what is the prospect of your say? I think for that you need the fast switching. And also the pulse shape not to change, so that uh, the at the end you can uh, trigger the many identical photons at the same time, uh, which were originally generated uh, in different times. What's your prospect to use your device for that? Yeah, so I mean this is very uh, we are at the very beginning of, of such uh, studies, but um, yeah, so the, um, I think these uh, open cavities, which are tunable and that relatively fast uh, switching time, let's say, uh, could be used for that. Um, a big challenge also is, is to get a, a percent enhancement, which uh, would be strong enough to, to reach uh, the limit between the radiative uh, lifetime and the coherence lifetime. Uh, right now, there, there is a big difference. So I would say uh, we really need to boost uh, optical uh, coherence lifetime. And uh, on the other hand, boost also the percent enhancement from these uh, cavities. So a uh, so number of issues here. Uh, one of them is that if you want to have a high uh, quality factor in the cavity, you would need uh, low scattering. And therefore, it means that the particle should be small enough. But when you reduce the size of the particle, typically uh, dephasing tends to uh, increase. And so this is. Uh, Say a difficult point in, in this um, uh, in this scheme. Uh, nearly radiatively limited single photon from a single rare earth sign has been uh, obtained uh, in another uh, way. Let's say by using a cavity which is milled directly into the single crystal. So it's a photonic cavity uh, in in a, sing a bulk single crystal. And so in this case, you you have uh, Kind of longer T2 and also a higher percent enhancement. And in this case, there uh, were these, these groups, so it's at Caltech, the group of Andrei Farah, uh, they were able to show nearly lifetime limited uh, emission. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. So there is, there is some prospects, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I, I, um, I mean, of course, we have uh, more questions, but uh, maybe we should allow people who want to, uh, you know, uh, get back to other things. Uh, we should we we'll probably uh, thank um, Philip once more. And uh, if you, yes. Philip, can you, if you can stay online for a bit longer, maybe there are a few more questions we can ask. There was a question yeah, sure. by someone uh, who has raised. Ah. ah, okay, okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, maybe, maybe a false alarm, <laughs> but I could still see a, a hand. So if you want to ask, please uh, feel free to ask now, please do so. So in the meantime, I would like to thank you again for the kind invitation. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the talk was uh, somehow uh, useful for people interested in these uh, spin systems and uh, what you can do with these materials. No, no, the talk was very interesting. So maybe we, we can just uh, ask now um, some of the questions which we wanted to know a little bit from you. So can you embed this uh, BM inside some heavy crystal and try to understand some of the properties of uh, spin coherence? Uh, so you mean by uh, modifying the surface, for example, or something like this? Yeah, no, in principle, it's possible. 
Uh, is, uh, but of course, you have also uh, some um, limits uh, or let's say issues to solve uh, for the synthesis. Uh, for example, this uh, high temperature annealing is not always very favorable to, uh, to these uh, core shell structure. So where you can really embed the particles. Uh, there, has been, there have been studies also in the past where people were, were having these particles into some disordered materials and look at uh, how the rare sign could interact with uh, some uh, um, TLS in, in, in the surrounding and things like that. Uh, on our side, we work more into uh, trying to uh, cure the defects inside the particles by different means. So high temperature, this plasma processing, and uh, also look at different rare signs, uh, which also have sensitivity, which can vary depending on, on the material and, and the rare earths. But uh, yeah, yeah, on the material side, I think there, there's still a lot of things to, to explore. Yeah. Uh, so getting, to getting rid of this thing. Right. So I want to getting rid of these defects. So these are these defects really the limiting, the thing which is limiting this uh, to this 10 millisecond uh, coherence time. Uh, yes, I, I think at least this is what we believe at this point. Uh, there is no sign, I mean, from what we saw, until now, there's no sign of strong change in, for example, phonon uh, coupling or uh, things like that, which could occur if we go to smaller sizes. And so we still see a response which is similar to the bulk crystal, but we have some additional components uh, that in principle should be 